if the noise in my mind surrounding my money and the anxiety reduced and I stopped like trying to come up with like quick fixes for my financial situation from day to day. Like, I feel like I spend a lot of time being like, Ooh, what if I went on like, you know, Alibaba and bought wholesale something and sold it on Amazon to make like a quick buck, you know? And it's just the noise is almost unbearable because it's created so much money. It just creates so much anxiety for me and needing to bring more money in. It's, I don't know. And I don't know if it correlates with just like technology now. And there's so, there's so much noise on the social media feeds and the marketing ads and the, you know, make $2,000 in 24 hours. I mean, I don't fall for that stuff, but it's like just a constant reminder, you know, ADHD rewired episode 297. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's a guest returning to the podcast for the second time is Natalie Walker. Natalie yay. is first on the pot. What? You said, yay. <laughs> I thought you said, mm, like, I got your name wrong. I'm like, how do I get Natalie Walker no. wrong? Like, no. Yay. 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 yay, yay, yay. yay. <laughs> it is Natalie Walker returning to the podcast for the second time. She's first on on episode 225. Uh, Natalie is a professional musician. She just released uh, her new EP back in September, uh, which was her first release since 2015. Uh, a lot has happened to the Colorado based singer in that time from parting with her long time label and going through the process of getting a diagnosis for ADHD. Natalie has learned to embrace her different brain and opened up about the challenges that have come from being a young, awkward kid with ADHD, learning how to navigate a thriving ish, I like that, a thriving ish <laughs> creative path into adulthood. Natalie, welcome back to the show. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to have you. And it's awesome that uh, you released a, a new album. That's that's very exciting. Thank you. I know. I just got back from the uh, the um, International Conference on ADHD. And it was actually, I think it was in 2014 that I wrote an original uh, song for the talent show that they, they do every year at the conference. And it was like, it was good. And then every time, every year I had tried to sit down to write another song and I just couldn't do it. So my talent was, I would just go up to the piano and just whatever came to me in that very moment is what I played. But this year I wrote another original song um, and I felt good to really work, like really work on a song, you know, not just like playing, being creative, but like really workshopping it and like sitting with it. And, um, and I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah. It's, um, what was your, what was your process for writing that song and so, what were like the hardest parts? Yeah. So, uh, the, the, the process was, um, I first wanted to kind of capture a feeling mm -hmm. and the feeling that I wanted to capture was because the song uh, was called better together, which was the, the theme of the, the conference. And I wanted to capture the feeling of vulnerability and acceptance and, um, and just sort of that, that wrestling with, with acceptance and then move into a, an empowerment feeling. So it started with a, uh, sort of a, a minor core progression. And then, uh, so the, ch so two challenges were, is that I, um, 
halfway through the song, it changes both the chord structure and the, the uh, time signature. Mm. So the adapting my voice to it was hard. Um, mm-hmm. So my process was uh, first I was just like, playing around with some chord structures and I would record the chord structures and then I would uh, just record it very just roughly on a uh, uh, garage band and then use the on garage band. They have a, uh, um, the multi take feature. So it will actually record every take. And so you can, you can listen back to every take. So uh, I would, for yes. a single line, I would have like 35 takes and then I would listen to it. Like, oh, I like what I did there. So I would just kind of improvise the way I sung the, uh, sung the song. Um, the hardest part for me, it was, you know, I've been since January, I've been going to a, uh, a singing circle, uh, improvisational singing circle in, in Chicago. And so it's taught me a lot more about like using my voice more rhythmically. Um, mm-hmm. and so I was really trying to apply some of those things that I learned, um, um, I did not write in a song that was easy to sing because um, I had to like sing it and hit the, the the syllable in the right place at the right spot for it to work. Um, yeah. like, during my, during the sound check for the talent show, I totally screwed up and I'm like, oh God, like, should I even do this? I was like, <laughs> but, <laughs> so right as I was waiting to go up on stage, I was listening and I had an earbud in and I was listening to the recording of just that first line because I knew if I hit the first line correctly, I would get the song. But if I screwed up the first line, the whole thing would be off. Yeah. So, but it, it, it went off with that. It went, went well. The hardest part was that transition between like changing a time signature and corporation in mid song, mid, in the middle of the song. Yeah. And that's really a challenge. That's why I don't play and sing a lot because it's too much for my brain to yeah. handle. So, a lot of times I just prefer to sing with someone else playing and doing that part because. So kudos to you. And I think that's interesting that you said that you wrote the song start. You started with a feeling because that's how I write. Um, you know, I call it intuitive songwriting. And I think a lot of people may write like that probably, but a lot of people just have someone write the music and the song for them. And then they show up to the studio and sing it because they're, you know, the song has been, paid for by a label or whatever. But yeah, that's how I write too. Like I have to be in a room with someone else though and, you know, workshop a song for however many hours to get it written and completed, but it's all like intuitive for sure. So the, the space between your last album and the EP that you just put out, what was, um, what was going on during that time? A lot. Um, (laughs) so much decisions, big decisions, uh, you know, a decision to officially end, uh, things with the label that I had been signed to previously for 10 plus years. Um, in doing that legally was an interesting challenge. Um, and, you know, kind of dip my toe in, in the spring of, this year by releasing a cover of cold plays yellow and it's pretty like ambient and mellow. Um, it's a, it's a good, it was a good thing for me to do to kind of see the process of what it would feel like and look like to put out a song. Um, and I learned a lot from just doing that and then decided to, uh, start writing music for this EP and uh, in the spring started traveling to Encinitas where my producer Ryan Molina lives. Uh, so we wrote a lot of the stuff was already sort of mapped out. And then I went to Encinitas to work in the studio to get everything laid out um, for a couple of, a couple of different trips. I went out there and did that. Um, what else did I do? I launched a Patreon. No, we, we, I think we talked about that. Was that it, was my mastermind. Remember uh, lots of nudging from you and everybody else in, in the arc that I was in. Yeah. So Natalie was in one of the, uh, our, our coaching accountability groups about, uh, it's about two years ago, year and a half ago ish. It was last year. It was last year. Yeah. But it was, I think it was in the summer of last year is when I started 
maybe. Um, and, but you were, it definitely, and you were doing like you were you had like a, a makeup business and like a, were you doing like a cooking thing too, or is that something else? Yeah, no, I was working as just like a sous chef at a restaurant, which actually ended up closing, unfortunately. Uh, but I still am a makeup artist. I still have a makeup business and that keeps me busy in the summer months. But um, yeah, I'm definitely multi-passionate and but the the interesting thing was like after we finished the arc and the mastermind and all of that, I feel like that kind of pushed me into the zone of discomfort in a good way. You know, you guys were all really encouraging and um and in fact, you know, some people from the arc still are in touch with me occasionally, which is really great. Um, it was good to like meet other people with a similar mindset, similar challenges. And so I started a Patreon in December, kind of a soft launch, (laughs) um, and just got clear about how I want to, how I want to move in, in the world as an independent artist and, and how I want to see myself as, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure to when you're an artist to, to be perfect or to make something perfect. And therefore it's never done or finished. Uh, and I really, really was intentional about not getting hung up on the details as much as just creating and within the craft itself in the song yeah creating well and and the things that surround it like social media the pressure to to have numbers my numbers are so dumb like i have like 400 followers on instagram you know i my daughter has more followers on instagram than i do let's let's increase that what's your what's your instagram (laughs) uh you can follow me on instagram at natalie walker music please follow me. And you know, Instagram is amazing because that's where I engage the most with my fans and patrons. Mm. Um, and like I respond to every message that I get and in stories and it's a fun social media app for me. I really, really have a hard time with Facebook and I have 14,000 people on my Facebook fan page. And it's a really difficult thing for me to, go t- I just have what's, a really hard time. Yeah, what's difficult about it for you? Um I have for me it's political disagreements with mm. Mark Zuckerberg and how he handles data and privacy and yeah. it's it is um it's a tough one for me because I I guess I'm just a little bit old school in that sense, you know. But isn't and, isn't and like, maybe I'm wrong. Does I know it, Facebook, Facebook owns or, Instagram. So isn't it yeah. kind of the same thing? Um, possibly. I mean, <laughs> here's the difference. Okay. Facebook blasts the, the clickbait articles and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I just feel like it's a big old dumpster fire. It's not necessarily even Mark Zuckerberg as much as it is just the cha- the utter chaos that yeah. you see on Facebook. So I actually don't have a personal Facebook account and I have my fan page. Um, I'm just making excuses for why I don't go to my fan page very much, <laughs> but I stream all of my posts and stories from my Instagram. It all goes onto my Facebook fan fan page. So Messenger is difficult for me because people do reach out to me on Messenger yeah. and I log into Facebook maybe once every two weeks and then I see messages and I'm like, crap. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But, I, uh, I have a couple of uh, well crafted apology um, canned responses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. That's it's just the accessibility that's if you're accessible in too many places, it becomes very overwhelming. Oh, I think yeah. For, for any brain. Um, yes. So unless you have I've, a whole like media team working like on your behalf. Yes. And I think that people assume that I do. It's literally just me. And when I was uh, doing like I did like a Facebook ad campaign through an agency that I hired and it was crazy the amount of money we spent on Facebook ads and, um, and it was effective to a degree but they wanted me to respond to comments and I just literally didn't have the time to do it. So I had my daughter doing it for me 
Cause she's super like, she just doesn't get her feelings hurt. And she's like, okay, mom, mm. I can handle that. She's a teenager. So anyway, yeah, it's a lot. Okay. <laughs> uh, see so you're, you're on Instagram. Um, that's like the one platform that I, people keep telling me you should do more stuff on Instagram. And I'm like, I, I don't really understand Instagram. Um, how would you explain it? How would I explain Instagram? To someone who, you know, to me, how I, how um, I use Instagram and engage and. You know, Instagram, I feel like it's probably, I haven't, I know what I need to do to make it work and to okay. get more followers, but it's actually taking the time to do it, but it's more, it feels more engaging. Okay. Um, it's not more engaging. It's a different kind of engaging because you can post a photo and tell a story or you can post in your stories as well to share a little bit more. It's not annoying to post on your stories three to 10 times a day. Some people post right. on their stories 10 times a day. Okay. It would be really annoying if I did that on Facebook. Right. Right. Um, and it's a little bit more of like a vanity app, I think, because I can post like cute photos of myself and, and then people like them, but I think likes are going away, which is cool. Cause so then if I that... posted cute photos of myself, do you think people would follow? <laughs> I don't know. You'd have to look at your insights and then <laughs> your insights will tell you what posts are the most popular. People, One thing that I would s- tell me that Erica, you have a face for podcasting. So uh, just keep up the podcast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, that's not true. Stop it. One thing that I've seen podcasters do that I really like is there's an app that you can, and I'll, I'll email it to you. There's an app that you, and you may have already heard it. You can upload snippets of like, yeah, say, I've seen that. It has like, the, the, like the, almost like a movie wave file. Yes. Yeah. And if you just did one of those a week, like with a preview or two a week of a preview of the episode that's dropping the following Tuesday, like if you did it every Monday, then, you know, people, or you actually, that's dumb. You should do it on Tuesday when that, when your podcast drops so that people will hear the snippet and then they'll be like, Oh crap, I've got to listen to it because you're front of mind. Right. So that's how marketing works. That's, that's how marketing works. It's, it's, there's so many things and the, the game keeps changing. And, uh, but it's about how do you get your message and your, your craft and the, what you're trying to provide, uh, to your community. I mean, that's, that's what marketing is. Like people say, oh, I don't want to do marketing. Marketing is evil. It's, no, marketing is just, it's communicating a message. That's, that's what marketing is. Um, yeah. So yeah. And if you're serving someone, then, I mean, if you're offering a service or a yeah. solution, then it's powerful. Let's do this. So as uh, much as I would love to keep diving into like shop talk, um, cause it's interesting to me. Let's, uh, let's, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back from the break, I know that you said that you are really looking to get some coaching cause you started your own record label. So basically started a business. Um, and you're, uh, there's some areas where you were kind of on the struggle bus with some stuff around like money and stuff like that. Um, yeah. so let's, uh, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive right into that. So we will be right back. Do you feel like you've wasted time not getting enough things done? Do you need help? Are you feeling stuck? You are not alone. There are lots of people who feel this way, and some of them have already decided to sign up for our first registration kickoff event on November 21st at 11 a.m. Central for ADHD Rewired's online video-based coaching and accountability groups. The kickoff event is almost full. You don't have to feel alone. Are you ready to take a journey together? The structured accountability is huge. I can see the changes in everyone. This is the first thing that I have endeavored in that's actually brought me success. There was so much more. This has been beyond tools and skills. There have been tools and skills, but it's gone beyond. You know, a lot of this class has been about courage in so many different ways and on so many different levels. Every week has been something that has been mind-blowing and life-changing. This group is like a safety net with everyone connected hand to shoulder to heart. There is a lot of heart in our coaching and accountability groups. Our registration kickoff event is only two days away if you're listening to this on the day it came out. Don't hesitate to join in. Winter sessions start January 10th and go through March 20th. 
go to coachingrewired.com. This is our 19th season of coaching and accountability groups. The journey can start now. Before this group, I thought I had to do everything. And I learned that it's really good to offload stuff. It's really good to say no to stuff. Oh, for sure. I'm ADHD. After doing this group, I don't feel like I'm a failure anymore. I've gotten more done in the last 10 weeks than I had done in the previous three or four years. It's so good to feel in a group with people that share the same problems, the same troubles. If you guys are my mirrors. I can see myself and all of you and we're all beautiful works in progress. What if you woke up one day and looked in the mirror and knew there were other individuals just like you working together to live a better life? Join us for ADHD Rewired's 19th season of coaching and accountability groups. It's time for a new way of thinking. Join us for our next coaching groups that start January 10th. If the November 21st registration kickoff event is closed because it's full, you can click the big purple button at the website and sign up for our second event on December 5th. Don't hesitate to start this journey. You are not alone. Join ADHD Rewired's 19th season of coaching and accountability groups and find connection and some answers. There's nothing like having a group of people where it's safe to talk about your struggles, to share the things that are hardest, to not be judged for those things and to actually be embraced and helped for that. Go to coachingrewired.com and click on the big purple button. Remember, our first registration kickoff event is only two days away on Thursday, November 21st at 11 a.m. Central. Winter sessions start January 10th and go through March 20th. If you go to the website at coachingrewired.com and the first registration event is closed, don't hesitate to register for an invitation to our second registration event on December 5th. Just click the big purple button and we'll send you the invitation to that event. We filled up at our second event last time, so you won't want to wait. Registration is by invitation only, and you have to attend one of our registration events to join. These coaching groups fill up fast, so sign up today and join other people just like you. So go to coachingrewired.com and click the big purple button. That's coachingrewired.com to learn more and to get on our registration invitation list. I've been watching this group for a year. It's the best decision I've ever made. If you're thinking about joining this group, do it. It will be life changing. One more time. That's coachingrewired.com. And this week on Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb. How about some compassionate ass kicking for the win? Will delves into the realm of accountability. What is it? How do you leverage it to get things done? Check out Hacking Your ADHD this week and every Monday. Join Will as he explores ways that you can work with your ADHD brain to do more of the things you want to do. If you haven't checked it out, do yourself a favor. Go subscribe to Hacking Your ADHD. These are fun snack-sized podcasts that cover different ways to hack your ADHD. That's Hacking Your ADHD, available to everyone, everywhere you consume podcasts. All right, we are back with Natalie Walker, and uh, let's dive right in. So you left your record label. Yes. You started your own... To the LLC. Yes. Tell us. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a label cause it's just little old me and it's a brand new baby. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily want it to be a label, but it's basically a place for my money to live from, you know, from my music. Okay. Um, and it- a place for my money to go into from my Patreon. We're, we're, not, we're not against labels here, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not either. I, love labels who are responsible and transparent. And that's all I'll say about that. And clearly that um, you're like exposing your vulnerabilities to your business. Like then you're an awesome label because we're diving in. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I have this, uh, I like, it's one of those things that I like get tight in my chest when I even start talking about it because it gives me so much anxiety. Um, there is 
I could do one of two things. I could do, I could learn my own bookkeeping. Like I could learn how to manage my money myself. Um, and I think that, I mean, intuitively, I think that would be a good idea because I need to learn how to manage my personal finances as well. Um, but it's like, where do I start? You know, that's kind of, and I don't want to get into trouble with the tax thing and all of that, you know, and being like a multi-passionate person who has a couple of businesses, I have my makeup business and then I have the music. I feel like I need to just gain more control of that situation financially, um, and make really, and make good decisions surrounding that. Um, surrounding we'll focus on the music LLC cause obviously that's relevant in this conversation and it would cross over to any other small business. Okay. So let me just, uh, tell it, reflect back what I heard. So you're having a lot of anxiety around, um, how to manage the money. Um, you're trying to figure out if you should learn, uh, to manage money yourself. You're not sure where to start. Um, you want to have control over your money and you want to make informed decisions. Yes. And the other option would be hiring a bookkeeper Mm -hmm. to do it for me because I don't know. I mean, I'm, I tend to sometimes wonder, but money is very serious. Like it's something that I should know how to deal with. And I'm, and be just like a grown ass woman about it for the first time in my whole life, you know, but it's, there's just such a block there that I, I have to figure out how I can break through that, you know? And I've started listening to Susie Orman cause she scares me a little bit. And I think that, you know, I need like a swift kick to get, things moving. All right. So <laughs> as, first of all, I think that, uh, so many of us can relate to, to this. Um, you know, you know, as a, a business owner myself, um, I know where my strengths are and I know what will put me on the struggle bus and, uh, managing the financial aspect of my business and looking at the details and doing the accounting and the taxes, Um, that, I think the last time I attempted to do my own taxes, I actually can very vividly recall exactly where I was because I remember having a, a gnarly panic attack after like spending hours doing one of those, I think it was TurboTax or something. I realized like, I'm not doing this right. Like nothing, this is not working. And so I ended up after like getting the TurboTax software, I ended up then hiring a, a uh, accountant <laughs> and I realized I am never going to attempt to do my own taxes again. Um, cause this is like my brain like is laughing at me cause it does, it can't do it. So the, mm-hmm. what I can do is I can learn who I can trust by developing relationships. Right. And so I think when it comes to money, uh, tr- like we want to trust, like, I think part of why we want to be able to, to be in control is because people can screw us over right with, with our money. And that's, that's an awful, uh, scenario. So it's, it's figuring out who can I trust with my money to advise me in a way that, uh, has my best interests, uh, at heart. Right. Yeah. So part of, you know, having, I mean, you have so many strengths and like all of us with ADHD, we have things that we're, we, we just suck at. Right. Like, and I think that you still have to be responsible for the thing, but it doesn't, we don't have to be the one that does the thing. Right. Right. And even when, um, I was starting my business and, and I hired a, a bookkeeper, um, you know, in the very beginning I was, you know, my, my wife was like, well, can't we just, you know, do it yourself? And I'm like, I can't afford to, to do it myself because I'm going to screw it up or I'm going to avoid it. And then I'm going to provide all these billable hours and not bill for them. Um, and like, that's not a good business model. So it's, I sort of look at it as the cost of doing business is that I have to build a team of people to support all the things that I'm just not good at. Right. Right. 
I do think it's important to have an understanding of it, right? Because I think that there a, a basic understanding is important. Um, but to have someone that can help you execute the day-to-day stuff around the finances, I think, is also helpful. So you said that you have a lot of, uh, as a lot of us do, a lot, a lot of sort of head junk around money. Yeah. Talk to yeah, us about I would that. call it, I would call it, and you know, and I see a therapist as well and it com- money comes up frequently and it's the shame. There's like this shame attached to my inability to, uh, manage my personal finances. And that trickles into all of the areas of my life. And it, it really affects my day-to-day peace of mind. Um, so, you know, I think that I do, I need to be proactive in taking steps to manage my personal finances, because I think that that will cross over into more responsible decisions with my business. What, 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 what are, tell me when you think about the challenges managing your personal finances, what, what are those specific challenges for you? I have been able to pinpoint it pretty, you know, years and years of being like, being like, what is my problem? And just avoiding it. It's shame. Okay. It's 100% shame, shame because around. when I, when I look at my finances, I see debt, I see avoidance and then and negligence. And, um, and it's interesting cause I'm not like, I'm not like a materialistic person. I'm not an impulsive shopper. Like I don't have a shopping addiction. I don't spend copious amounts of money. Um, but I, it's just, there's something there, something there when I think about my self-worth is tied to the money that's coming in and going out and the debt specifically is a really big thing for me. So I, let me ask a question for clarification. So is it a, so it really is a, a tied to whether the, the balance sheet is black or red versus like the amount of money you're bringing in? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when I'm bringing money in, it's, I need to pay off this credit card or I, you know, I'm in debt. This isn't really my money. Like I have to pay off my debt. Um, and where, where is the debt from? The debt is from, (laughs) I started a, so I have an esthetician license. And so I went to school for that. The debt has been from me trying to bring in money outside of my music career Mm -hmm. because I don't know if you all know this, but being a musician does not mean that you're like going to live on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, (laughs) I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not saying that I live in like, I'm like living in squander or whatever, but I definitely am not. I have never and will never be rich and that's okay with me. Um, but I definitely have spent money trying to, and having an esthetician license is important. You have to be licensed to be a makeup artist in Colorado, but most of my debt has come from choices that I've made to try and advance myself in other areas to bring in more income to eventually pay off that debt, which is such a dangerous like cycle if yes, you're not I, I would, following through. I would say that your your what you value, you're spending and investing money in. And keep in mind that when we do spend money on something with the intent for it to uh, return something back to us, when those uh, when the return doesn't pay off, we call that paying tuition. You know, it's it's learning, (laughs) right? Um, You said, Natalie, that you'll never be rich, right? Why'd you say that? That's my mindset. Okay. Period. Like I'm, I also like wrote in a journal, like my issues with money. And one of them was that I'm afraid of money. Um, mo money, mo problems, right? Okay, so what are you afraid <laughs> money will do? Like what's the fear behind the money? I don't know. It might be just if I ha if I get more money, then it just means that I, I have an opportunity to make more financial 
mistakes. Isn't that, it's just crazy. Like it's. Okay. So you um, have more money. So why, so what kind of mistakes are you afraid that you would make? Maybe just like spending it frivolously and not saving it and not knowing how to invest it and not making it grow. Um, you know, and disappointing the people in my life by not being making wise choices with okay. it, you know. Um, Do you have a financial advisor? No, I have spoken to a couple of different options and people. I have a really hard time. Like, so it's like I hire a bookkeeper and then a financial advisor and like, I don't know where to start. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. And I, and God, I sound so whiny, but I also have this like very, um, I have a scarcity mindset. So I get anxiety when someone's like, okay, I can do your bookkeeping for you, but it's going to cost $350 a month. If even if you have like three transactions in your business account. So that scarcity mindset, and this is something that uh, has popped up for me too, from time to time. Um, is something that when I've noticed it pop up for me, I've, I've been able to, and I've had to make a very sort of conscious, like do the thing that just feels like the thing I shouldn't be doing. Right. Um, and to really, uh, try to change the thinking to more of an abundance mindset. Every time I've been able to hold on to an abundance mindset, even when, for good reason, a scarcity mindset would have made sense. Um, that is what propelled my business forward. Um, and any time that I've been, have had that scarcity mindset, it slowed things down and it just increased anxiety for me. Um, so you said a, a bookkeeper would cost you like 300 and something a month, no matter what income is coming in. Yes. Um, and I found another one who was going to be $150 a month. Okay. Um, and these are specific to the entertainment industry. Okay. What do you think so, it costs you to, uh, in just your own level of anxiety, let alone dollars and cents? Um, man, I, how many therapy sessions have you had talking about the stress of money? Well, I don't, sometimes I don't go to therapy because I have a scarcity mindset. <laughs> <laughs> we so, have a perplexing problem here. I'm going to therapy okay. to talk about my scarcity mindset, but I don't go to therapy because I have a scarcity mindset to spend money on therapy. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but it does, I, I don't know. I, this is something that I'm just now getting, feeling like I'm, there's some movement happening in my brain about it because mm-hmm. it's just been like shoved over into the corner for a really long time and I've never dealt with it. So I'm at a point now in my life, at my age, in my relationship, with my family, in my business, it's unavoidable. Like it's a glaring thing. It's the thing in my life that is holding me back from moving forward. And I just get really money is such an emotional thing for me that it's really difficult for me to make like pragmatic decisions, uh, surrounding my money. What models did you have growing up around money? None. And was it was money? One of those things that like, we don't talk about money. I think So I struggled so much in high school. I never like passed, you know, algebra, pre-algebra, like numbers were really big struggle for me in school. And my, and my father would try to help me with my math homework and it would turn into just like, why can't you get this? Uh And then it would be, you know, Um, and my father is amazing. He's a good man, but I have this, it's almost like I'm afraid of numbers. Like I have this fear that has followed me from my childhood of like numbers are bad. Math is bad and you should stay away from it because makes sense to me. If you try to do it, (laughs) somebody's going to yell at you and tell you you're stupid, you know? Okay. And so 
that's I so don't know. okay. So I, I two things. One, I think that any skill can be a learnable skill, but I also think there are certain skills that we have to question if it is worth learning. Okay. Mm-hmm. When when I started my business, it was not until I started my business and got a credit card processing machine that I learned that I had a dyscalculia where I would like swap numbers around when I would read a number and then try to like transfer by writing it out. I would mm-hmm. swap numbers around. I would be entering a credit card number in and I and it would keep saying invalid number. And one day I had my wife watch me do. It. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And she noticed that like if there was like a four eight eight nine, I would put it in as four eight nine nine. Like I would swap that patterned number and it's and it's like, oh no wonder why I struggled with math so much. Right. So even when I would understand how to do something mathematically. I wasn't always able to apply that understanding, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that with ADHD, there are different, uh, you know, coexisting things that come along with it, um, including learning disabilities around math and numbers, right? So why, like, it doesn't make sense if you think, take a step back from it. Like, why, if I'm creating a business where the business is something that only I could do. So it's, it's your voice. It's your music, right? It's your, uh, um, the, 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 um, makeup stuff that you're doing, right? Like only you can do that, right? That is what brings in the business, right? There are lots of people who can manage the books, right? And so if you are, if you're spending time, if you're spending, executive function, if you're spending emotional energy trying to manage something that feels like you are hiking up a mountain in uh, high heels, um, like maybe you should get on a different path, right? Like go to the path that's more like geared towards you. And, you know, and it's similar to when you're building a relationship with a any kind of, whether it's a financial planner, a bookkeeper, right? You got to think about it as, I think sometimes what happens is like, we have this all or nothing thinking behind it. Like, well, what if it doesn't work out with this person, right? Well, Mm -hmm. then you break up with that person, right? Right. And it's not like, it's it's not something that um, is a forever decision. So you you feel out the relationship uh, with that person. Um, you know, I think one of the best places to start when you're looking for any kind of uh, a professional financial help, whether it's a bookkeeper, uh, uh, financial planner, is talk to people you know and ask them, who do you use? Do you like them? Can I get their number? Like, instead of just Googling, right, and going right. blind. Right. Is there a, if you could think of, say, three to five people that you would feel comfortable reaching out to and asking Uh, those people, Hey, do you have a financial planner? Do you have a bookkeeper? Um, do you like them? Who would those people be? Like, can you, can you make a list yourself to think about who those people would be? Yeah. And how does it feel the idea of asking those people? It's something that never occurred to me, but yeah, I mean, I would be super comfortable doing that. It's when I was looking down at my notes from when we talked a couple weeks ago. And the, uh, the last thing that I wrote in our notes is, uh, that you're still having a hard time asking for help. Yes, definitely. Um, I'm still the, the hero, you know, gotta be the hero, but it's not sustainable for my own day to day life. You know, let me ask you a question. So you you have a daughter. Yes. When you see her do something that maybe she was struggling with and you, you did something that you know that your help helped her then overcome something and is now able to do that thing. How does that feel? Um, It feels great. I mean, I think that my daughter is a confident person because I have like given her and she has recently been diagnosed with ADHD as well. And she has like a 4.0 GPA. Um, which is amazing. And it's almost like I look up to her, Mm. but she's so confident. And, you know, I feel like that's one thing that I didn't struggle with for a really long time. I did not lack confidence in a lot of areas of my life, but there are definitely the, the dark corners where I lack confidence, but I don't show it. And I don't ask for help because 
I want to be the hero of my own story, you know? And I think part of being that hero often involves empowering others. And I think if we can shift our mindset of from like asking for help as like, oh, that means I can't do it to asking for help as I am empowering someone to do something that they are good at doing and enjoy doing. And this is help. This is freeing me to do the stuff that I can focus on. Um, I mean, to me, it's not much different than helping out your own kid and feeling good about it. Like, I think that if you can sort of lean into the asking for help and seeing that, oh, this person's really helping me. Do you think that you would feel good about that? Yeah, I think I would. If, if, if the noise in my mind surrounding my money and the anxiety reduced and I stopped like trying to come up with like quick fixes for my financial situation from day to day. Like, I feel like I spend a lot of time being like, Ooh, what if I went on like, you know, Alibaba and bought wholesale something and sold it on Amazon to make like a quick buck, you know? And it's just the noise is almost unbearable because it's created so much money just creates so much anxiety for me and needing to bring more money in. It's, I don't know. And I don't know if it correlates with just like technology now. And there's so, there's so much noise on the social media feeds and the marketing ads and the, you know, make $2,000 in 24 hours. I mean, I don't fall for that stuff, but it's like just a constant reminder, you -hmm. know? So when I think that, I think everyone struggles with imposter syndrome, you know, if, so I've been in business now for nine years, five years as an online business. Um, and to tell you, if I, if I told you that I have all my financial shit figured out, I'd be telling you a big fat lie, right? Like I have people that kind of manage that, right? Um, you know, it's like, I, I sort of have to push myself to sometimes look at the stuff, right? And, you know, but I also know that if I were managing it myself, so it's sort of this like, I don't tell myself I should be doing this. I, I tell myself, it would be good if I had like the, the, I was real savvy with this stuff. Like it would be nice if, right. Mm-hmm. But I'm really yeah. good and savvy with other stuff. Right. And so I think it's that it's an empowering and freeing fe- feeling to let go of certain things. Right. As a business owner, the buck ends with me. So I have to still, you know, take responsibility for that stuff. A part of that responsibility is letting somebody else do the stuff that, that, I'm just not good at. Right. Yeah. And I think that if we look at it um, less of a monthly expense and look at it as how you want to live your, your life as a creative, as a business owner, um, we begin to then look at it. This is that way that I, as a person with ADHD who has something to offer the world, um, is going to do business in the world. Right. So I think that getting a, a basic understanding and financial kind of knowledge about stuff. So then you can have somebody implement and execute the things you're trying to do. Yeah. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, You said you have a financial advisor. When did, when did you get a financial advisor? Because I mean, my company, my LLC is very small. Like Mm -hmm. we don't have, I don't have like thousands of dollars in the bank, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I do accountability is something that I do respond really well to. But sometimes I wonder if it's a crutch, if I want someone to tell me what to do because otherwise I just wouldn't do it. Um, you know, or if it's something that I feel if, if it's something that you feel would be really a positive thing, but I wonder how you went about it. Um, well, so my, my dad was in the financial services, uh, industry. Um, so like, I didn't really understand what he did, but like he did financial planning for people. Um, and, uh, so he, the, he just imparted the value of, you know, savings and, and, uh, looking at retirement and stuff like that. Um, I didn't really, to this day, I don't really understand like the logistics of how it works. 
all I know is like I that I understand. Um, I talked about this at my presentation uh, at the at the chat conference. Um, that this idea that if we understood the the um, power of compound interest, we would all start investing whatever we could like today, um, because people with ADHD are profoundly underprepared for retirement, right? And if we can, if we have a thirty to forty year runway, like we can, even if we're just putting fifty or hundred dollars a month into the market, it we typically end up profoundly ahead versus just okay. putting something in like a savings account. Right. Right. It's yeah. usually in that like 30th year where it's like, whoa, like now my money's actually working to make money. Right. Mm -hmm. This is the difference mm -hmm. between like middle class to middle upper class people to people who are like upper class, you know, middle to upper class, middle to middle, middle upper class people. We work to make our money. Right. Like I work to make my money. People who are like rich, 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 their money makes the money. And when, when I first learned about that, I was like, well, that's a really interesting concept. So it's how do I, if I understand the, that idea and can accept that idea, what are the, the things I need to put into place and who can I tell someone I want, I want my money to make me money. How do I do that with my income? And can you set that up for me? Right. I'm not going to like I have a uh, I have a cousin who um, done very well. He understands the market. He's buying and selling stocks. And like this is like a game to him. I'm like, I, you know, that sounds fun if I understood any of that stuff. Right. Because it's it does seem kind of fun. But it also like you have to really keep your head in the market and, and keep your finger on the pulse at all times. You know, it's, 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 it's similar in some ways to when I first started getting into online business and, um, I believe it or not, before I started my podcast, I actually did, I wasn't on Facebook and I didn't even understand Facebook. Right. And I joined a membership community that costs a lot of money to join about to help me start the podcast. Right. Okay. And their online forums within the first month of me being in the community moved to Facebook. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm learning Facebook now. Right. Right. I'm, Grateful that that happened, right? So I dove in deep and learned. I was learning everything that I could about Facebook. I was following all these marketing people and I was really on top of it and all the, the changes that kept happening every two weeks, you know, and like I was on top of it. And then you take two or four weeks so you just step away from it because life gets busy and you're like, oh my God, things have changed. I don't even know what's changed. And it's, so it's like, if you want- It's to, exhausting. Yeah. And so I, I had to sort of take a step back from that and be like, all right, like, I can't be a marketing media like company in that way, right? In the same way that we can have someone manage our finances, we don't have to be someone who is like playing with our money. Yeah. Right? Right. Um, so looking at things like a, um, for looking at a financial planner, look for someone who is uh, a fiduciary. And a fiduciary by law is someone who is required to work in your best interest, which is kind of weird to think that there are people who don't have to work in your best interest when it comes to money. Didn't you talk about this on your podcast I a couple so. weeks yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah. When we had uh, uh, Aggie was in the hot seat. Um, yeah. And so it's just like okay. these little tidbits can mm -hmm. really help you. And I mean, if you go talk to a financial planner and you meet with them and you're like, that person just made me feel like, like stupid and feel like shit. Like that's not the right person. Right. So it, you know, so first reach out to your people. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I did. I, my financial planner is my father-in-law's financial planner. Right. Okay. Um, and I look at their financial situation. He has a, you know, they have a nice home where we, where we live. They also have it. They just recently bought another home in California. I think they're doing, they're comfortable. And so, yeah. you know, so I want to trust who they're trusting. You know, I don't yeah. have to reinvent the wheel to figure this out myself. And a business advisor is not a financial planner. They correct? can be, but not necessarily. Okay. Right. Do you have a business advisor? Uh, no, I don't have, no. Um, I'm, I'm part of a business like mastermind group that I've been uh, part of for about five years. Um, but as far as like a, now you look talking about consultant or like a. Yeah. I mean, but I think that uh, I have enough connections in the music industry that I could probably just do the thing, ask for help. The thing that I don't like doing. Let me ask you this. Why? Um, and this is just my, for my own ignorance. What, 
makes a bookkeeper that focuses in the music industry unique from a general bookkeeper? It's an interesting, that's a good question. There are, there are just different streams of revenue that come in a lot of different streams of revenue that come in for uh, someone like me. And the tax write-off situation is a little bit hairy. Uh, It needs to be, it needs to be done in a certain way. Obviously uh, I don't think a bookkeeper does that, but um, I think having an understanding of the music industry and the different streams of revenue is important for someone who I hired to do my bookkeeping, it might be just something that I'm telling myself. That's just not true because they'll just look at my account and say like, okay, what are these expenses? You know, like give them a category and we'll figure out your tax. Or I had a really good tax guy in New Jersey, like back in the day when I was just starting my career. Um, and if I could, and he's retired. And if I could find another one of him, that would be great. What made him good for you? He just always made sure that everything that could be written off was written off. Okay. Um, he just made sure that I broke even so that, because I was not making money, I was making some money, but like my expenses, I was going up to New York for a residency, you know, every single week. And that was like a hundred dollars a trip minimum and paying for a band to back me up and all of that. I had so many expenses surrounding what I was doing. Um, I feel like it would be, it would be good to have someone who has an understanding of what the lifestyle looks like, Mm -hmm. you know, so that they can be like, okay, this is when you were in the studio. These are your expenses, but it's also not rocket science. You know, it's not like any different from someone who has like an, who, someone who's like an author or has a podcast or like, we're all creative and we have our own unique expenses. And keep in mind, probably for the person who's the good accountant, creating an album probably looks like rocket science, right? Right. So it's, I think it's really just owning what you bring. And cause I think the more that we could put our focus and attention on our strengths and get help with everything else, the, the business that we're trying to grow is going to grow exponentially versus trying to wear all the hats, right? I think wearing all the hats is what someone who is in a scarcity mindset does. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, and being transparent with someone saying, I'm just kind of starting out here. Here's where I'm at. Like, um, and that you want to be, want the process to be explained to you. Like, so I want you to think about too, what, when you see yourself working, whether it's with a bookkeeper or an accountant or a, a financial advisor, how do you see it? Is it, are you sitting down with that person at, um, at their office, at your place? Is it virtual? Like think about what, what do you think would work for you? Mm-hmm. I don't know, probably in person, but I live in a really small community. Um, so I think virtually would be fine as well. I'm, I am reluctant to use someone in my small community just because it's so tiny and yeah. I've heard some horror stories Okay, you now. So, okay. I think, you know, you could probably find someone jump on a call with them once a month, you know, to go over the QuickBooks account, which I do have. And, you know, and there are financial coaches too. Right. You know, so you can look in, in that realm as well. So it's, <laughs> Sounds to me the first step is to reach out to your own network to get recommendations for people. Yes. When will you do that? We'll do it today. Yeah? Mm-hmm. What time? Um, it's 11, 11. I'll do it at 2 p.m. Do you want any accountability around that? Sure. Okay. What time should I put in my calendar that you're going to be letting me know that you've made those calls? Um, why don't you 
reach out to me or wait, I need to tell you after I'm done. Yes. And so it's sort of an, if this, then so if um, I don't hear from you by that time, say, I will then reach out. Let's say 5 PM today. Okay. So, Mountain time. All right. So I'm putting on my calendar here. Um, I mean, even <laughs> the, the, the fact that I could just like walk over to the office next to mine and ask someone to reach out to my next person to push it back 15 minutes, like makes it so that situation causes me no stress. Right. Right. It's like, it's that kind of stuff that yeah. now I can continue to be focused on what we're doing right here. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's invaluable. I mean, I get it. Like, um, I definitely, and it's not like, I'm not like, Oh, I don't want to pay a bookkeeper X amount of money because what they do is not important. I know how important it is. It's just me being like, I don't want to pay a bookkeeper to take care of it because what if the money isn't there, which an easy solution would be put the money aside for the year so that it's just, it lives in its own spot. And I know you said that about credit cards and I need to do that too. Cause it's just like, what am I doing? You know, I, I like looking at my bank account as I'm walking into a therapy session, you know, to make sure that the money is there. So like, that's how I'm living my life. And it's not, and I'm almost 40 years old. Like it's I, time for me just to like figure out a system that works for me. And experiment, you know, it, it, can engage in experimentation with systems, you know, so I think the more you do that and you're less attached to the thing that's going to work and you're like, let me just try this and see how this works. You'll, yeah. get, you'll get to the system that will work for you. Yeah. And I think that analog is more of a fit for me than digital. Um, what if you went so to I an office to- supply store and they, they have all those, those like accounting books that have the templates and it's just, it's a book that, where you can record your expenses and, and stuff like that. Yeah. That might work because digital is overwhelming for me. It's too shiny and distracting. So there's also, you know, um, another resource that I've, I've recommended before is, uh, uh Dave Ramsey's, uh, financial peace university. I've heard good things about it. Okay. And you know, just to get that. Cause I, th- you know, I think we do want to have a, a, decent understanding of what's happening. All right. So we're yes, not Yes. I have no idea what's happening. You're not, you're so not alone. You're, I mean, you're so not alone. I just want you to know that. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I look at the stuff that I'm doing with my, my business and the finances and I'm like, I don't even remember doing that thing to set up that thing. It's like, all right, it's being managed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's, it's when just realize what you're doing though. Like you're creating, a, you're making money playing music. Right. You're living the dream, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I was in, I had to cancel our first podcast interview because I was going to Los Angeles to write music in Laurel Canyon in this beautiful home with my friend, Will. Mm. And you know, it is like, it's such a gift. It's, it is my joy in life. And if I could figure out a way to truly feel proud of the money coming in and going out in my business, I think that would be a big accomplishment. So we'll talk in a year again, (laughs) after I put out two more EPs and putting out another EP in early 2020, and then one in the middle of next year. Um, and I'm just going to keep publishing music because that's what feels good. That's awesome. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. That's exciting. Here's what we should Thanks. do since we didn't take a second break. We're going to take a quick break when we come back. Um, I'm going to let you set up uh, one of the, uh, tell us about one of your songs and we'll, sure. uh, and we'll listen to it. So okay. we will be right back. I want to thank all of our patrons who support this podcast by giving a monthly financial contribution over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Patrons like Matthew and Kristen and Carrie Jazz. I think you got that right. It's kind of a cool name. Carrie Jazz, if I got that right. Who became patrons over the last few weeks. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for all your support. These contributions help offset the cost of the production of the show 
and a whole lot more. Thank you. If you love the show and you count on it each week, then I'm asking you to help out. Give an amount that makes sense to you. Check out the perks starting at just $5 a month. Or you can join me in a small group of other patrons every fourth Tuesday of the month for a group coaching call on Zoom if you support us at the $25 a month or more level. We do those calls at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 Eastern. And it really is a perk worth signing up for. Sometimes we have three, four, or five people. Last month, we had one person who basically got a one-hour coaching session with me for $25. So this is something that I love to be able to do, and I would love for you to be able to be a part of this. Whatever your reason for giving and whatever the amount you can give, thank you. It really does help, and it really does mean a lot. Become a patron at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. Don't miss next month's live Q&A on December 10th. Do you need some advice, some pressing questions that you have? Don't you wish that you had three ADHD experienced people in your living room giving you advice sometimes? Well, then join me, Brendan Mahan from ADHD Essentials and Will Curb from our newest podcast, Hacking Your ADHD, as we answer your questions live. We do this every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. This is a great way to be a part of the community. To register for our free Q&A, where we will answer your questions and do our best to help you with your challenges, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events events. And if you missed our live Q&A and you don't want to wait until December for it to come out on the podcast feed, we're going to post the session, the video of it on our Patreon page uh, for patrons who give at $5 a month. And also included in that will be a question that was not on the podcast and was not streamed on Facebook, a question that I didn't really want to answer on the podcast or on Facebook for, I guess, personal reasons. To find out why, you'll have to become a patron to uh, check that out. Um Let's just say I got really vulnerable. All right. So uh, to register for the live Q&A, it's ADHDrewired.com slash events. And if you want to check out the one from November, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. All right. We are back with uh, Natalie Walker. And um, tell us a song that uh, that we're going to listen to from your from your new EP. So I think um, Starry Eyed Kids would be a really good one for you to close out with. I wrote this EP. It's called Even Fall. It's about my childhood in the 90s in Indiana. And uh, Starry Eyed Kids is about just like the magic of our youth. And I was such an imaginative kid who saw the mad, who saw magic in everything. So, um, sort of my slogan for my music, which I came up with recently because I did speak to like a branding expert is, uh, it's music to make you believe in magic, um, or music Mm. that makes you believe in magic again. Of course I'm going to F up my slogan, (laughs) (laughs) but that's kind of, that's kind of my, and it's so funny because I did have, I did like a little, uh, PR run and a lot of blog, blogs that wrote about the music referenced m- magic and used that word to describe, uh, the music. So it's pretty fitting. So yeah, this will it's a little nostalgic tune that you can listen to and think back to the good things about being a kid. Mm. So starry eyed kid and the EP is called the, co- the song starry eyed kids. The EP is called even fall. You can hear it across all platforms and, um, and it's super mellow and chill and it's, it's it kind of almost, tra- it's almost trance. Like it's, it's, I love it. Mm-hmm. Thanks. All right. So here is a uh, starry eyed kid with uh, Natalie Walker. Um, before we, uh, uh, finish that up and we'll end up with the song. How can people find your stuff? Like I said before, look me up on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, all of that good stuff. You can also, uh, find me on Instagram at Natalie Walker music and Facebook at Natalie Walker music as well. 
um, Twitter, Natalie Walker is, if you want to see spicy Natalie, just look at my Twitter. (laughs) I, I tend to, uh, have a little wine and tweet about things not related to music sometimes as everyone does on Twitter these days, it seems. Um, but yeah, that's where you can find me. Well, Natalie, I want to congratulate you on, on your success on, you know, getting out on your own. You got a Patreon page going. Um, I do. Oh yeah. That's patreon.com backslash Natalie Walker music. Come to, into my Patreon community. It's yeah. awesome. I love my community. That's awesome. So Natalie, thank you. And let's, uh, let's listen to Starry Eyed Kid.
This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos. I've posted podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. 10% Happier and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more say magical i unexpectedly fell in love with the harry potter series and i don't usually listen to those kinds of books and i loved it and of course if you haven't yet boarded the Brene brown bus yet check out Brene brown's books starting with the gifts of imperfection daring greatly rising strong the power of vulnerability and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity check out her 2018 book dare to lead and Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.